Hello everybody, welcome to the first Bio in a Bottle AP unit review video. We're going to be releasing these videos every Monday and Friday, so make sure you stay tuned, make sure you subscribe, make sure you like this video so you can see future videos that we will be creating for AP Biology unit review. So me and Ambika, which is the other girl on this account, we're going to be making these videos together, so sometimes I might be the one who's narrating and Ambika might be the one who's narrating. And me and Abika are relatively new to YouTube videos and stuff. So it we're not going to be perfect on the first few tries. So please leave like any recommendations that we can improve on. And please just leave any constructive criticisms. It would help us a lot. We want to improve as much as we can. And we want to give you guys the best AP biology review possible. <laughs> so this is the first unit, the chemistry of life. And the first topic is the structure of water and hydrogen bonding. So the structure of water is pretty unique. Um, it's composed of two hydrogens, one oxygen. The hydrogens are positive. The oxygen are, is negative. And they share a covalent bond between the two hydrogens and the one oxygen. And as you can see here, and this is an unequal sharing of electrons. As you can see, the electrons are more pulled towards oxygen than they are to the hydrogen so this causes for hydrogen to be slightly positive and for oxygen to be slightly negative and it allows for hydrogen bonds to take place because the hydrogen um atom is slightly positive it will connect to regions of other water molecules as well as other molecules in general that are slightly negative so as you can see the slightly positive area of this hydrogen atom is connecting to the slightly negative um oxygen atom and this allows for cohesion and adhesion to take place in which cohesion is where water forms a hydrogen bond with other water molecules while adhesion is where it forms bonds with other molecules in general so as you can see here this represents a polar or charged object this would be adhesion because it's bonding to a different molecule while this would be cohesion as it's, as it's bonding to another water molecule. And cohesion and adhesion both allow for capillary action to take place. And this allows for water to like move up structures such as roots, which allows for the water to access the certain amount of water it needs because it's able to move up the roots through cohesion, adhesion, adhesion and hydrogen bonds. And some other important properties of water is that it has a high surface tension, which is because of there's a there's large amounts of hydrogen bonding on the surface of the water. And this is why if you would belly flop into a pool, uh, it would most likely hurt. That's because it has a high surface tension. And also there's some bugs and animals that can walk on top of water because of water's very high surface tension. And another property that's very important to life actually is that the solid state is more dense than the liquid state. This allows ice to flow on top of water. And this causes for bodies of water, such as lakes, to not freeze through because the ice floats on top and it allows for marine organisms to thrive underneath the ice. And another very important property is that water has a high heat capacity, which means that it can absorb large amounts of energy without the temperature drastically changing. So this also has to do with bodies of water and this allows for um, these large bodies of water to not hold drastically different um, changes in temperature as the temperature around it changes, which allows for conditions for life to be suitable for organisms that live underneath the water. And water also has a high solvency, which allows for certain for all organisms to attain the nutrients they need. Okay, this is section 1.2, which is elements of life. So basically, for cycling the matter, you don't really need to know the each specific cycle. You just need to know that these cycles allow for there to be organization within environments, and it allows for organisms to thrive. And also, new molecules are formed through these cycling cycles of matter. And next, we're going to be talking about the four major biomolecules, which are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So there's actually a few acronyms that are used to memorize 
the composition of each of these biomolecules. And the acronym is CHO, CHO, CHON, CHOMP. So this goes in alphabetical order. We start with carbohydrates because it starts with a C. And its acronym is CHO. And CHO meaning that it has one carbon, one hydrogen, and one oxygen atom. And next is lipids, which also holds a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atom. And then proteins, which holds a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen atom. And also it contains a nitrogen atom. And nucleic acids hold carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and also a pho additional phosphorus atom. So CHO, CHO, CHON, CHOMP is an easy acronym to remember in order to remember what the composition is of each, um, of each biomolecule. So each of these biomolecules, they hold different functions. I'm going to go through this pretty fast. But before I begin, um, it's important that you know that each of these biomolecules, they're composed of individual molecules, which are called monomers. And these monomers are bonded to kept together to form a polymer, which is basically a large amount of these monomers. So carbohydrates, basically a fast source of energy, and their monomer monomers are called monosaccharides. And lipids are long-term source of energy. And these technically do not have monomers. And proteins are made up of monomers called amino acids. And they make up enzymes, and they also serve a purpose in the immune system. And nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA, their monomers are nucleotides. And nucleic acids are basically the instructions for the cell to carry out its functions and processes to create proteins. And DNA and RNA are basically like instructions for the entire cell. So carbon is a very important element because it's so abundant within so many biological like structures and you're going to see carbon a lot within like diagrams and stuff and carbon creates a carbon backbone which is between other carbon atoms and a carbon backbone is basically strong bonds that are um, created within these other carbon molecules and it's so a carbon backbone is so common that you'll most likely just see a squiggly line as shown here when it's represented in diagrams. Okay, this is 1.3, introduction to biological macromolecules. So I'm gonna be explaining two different processes, hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis um, versus hydrolysis. These are when um, two, mon two monomers of a polymer are split apart. And this is done by an enzyme bringing an H2O to the, to the bond, which is, this is the bond, the O is the bond between the two different monomers. And here is a water molecule, and it's brought together to this bond. The water molecule splits. Uh, this side, an OH attaches to it, and an H attaches to this side. And this allows for there to be a hydroxide, an OH, um, on each side of the monomer, which allows it to split. And dehydration synthesis is essentially the opposite, where a water molecule is removed in order for these monomers to be joined together. So here's what would be a result of a uh, hydrolysis, a hydroxide on each side, and in order to join them together, a H2O is removed. So this H would be gone, and this H and O would be gone, and these two will be bonded together by an oxygen atom. And this is 1.4, properties of biological macromolecules. So we're going to be talking about the structures of each biological macromolecule. This is the structure of nucleic acids. This is the structure of DNA and RNA. And I'm going to be going over the differences of DNA and RNA later in the slideshow. But basically, the three major components of both DNA and RNA is that it has a phosphate group, a five-carbon sugar group, and a nitrogenous base. So the five-carbon sugar group, um, diff like is different between different nucleic acids. For example, DNA has deoxyribose sugar, while RNA has ribose sugar, as you can see here. And also another thing that differs between different nucleic acids is a nitrogenous space. So in DNA, that, that nitrogenous base right here, it can either be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine, while in RNA, it can be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or uracil. 
And both DNA and RNA hold different functions. They carry out different functions. And this is the structure of protein. It has a hydrogen group, an amino group, and a carboxyl group. And both the amino group, which is here, and the carboxyl group, it allows for the amino acid to maintain its directionality. And an R group is what differs between amino acids. And based on what the R group is, it can be very important as it can be hydrophilic, hydrophobic, ion. And basically the R group is what determines the function of proteins and the structure of proteins because it's how the R group determines how it folds, how a protein folds and the shape of a protein. And this is the structure of carbon carbohydrates. They're made up of simple sugars and the type of simple sugars basically determine the function of the carbohydrate. This is the structure of a lipid. A lipid contains a polar or hydrophilic head while having a nonpolar or hydrophobic tail. So the head, this is the, this is the lipid head. It reacts with, it like bonds with water or in, interacts with water while in the nonpolar section is not interactive water. And this is 1.5, the structure and function of biological macromolecules. So these are the properties of DNA. So DNA runs from a three prime end to a five prime end. So as you can see here, um, this side is a three is a three prime end, which is defined by the five carbon sugar, and this is the five prime end with it, which is um, defined by the phosphate group. And these are two different DNA strands. This is the one DNA strand. This is another DNA strand, and they run oper they ran they run anti parallel, which means they run in different directions. So as you can see here, this one starts with a three prime, this side is a five prime, and they basically run in different directions. And these um, individual monomers, they are connected through um, covalent bonds. And these, the adenine and thymine, and these on each side are connected through um, hydrogen bonds. So here you can see the hydrogen bonds, these dots connect, like these dots represent the hydrogen bonds. And between adenine and thymine, there is two hydrogen bonds. And while between guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds. And that, next we'll be talking about the different structures of protein. This is the primary structures of protein, which is basically like a simple polymer. Uh, these are where amino acids are connected. The amino group and the carboxyl group are connected in order to form a polypeptide. This is um, what a peptide looks, peptide chain looks like. Next is the secondary structure, is, and this is where the peptide, peptide cha chain begins to fold. And this is due to the R group. As I said earlier, the R group determines the shape and structure of the protein. So based on what the R group, R group is, it will determine like the shape of the protein. So it could either be a beta plated, so the secondary structure, it could either be an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. And this is a tertiary structure of the protein where the R groups also have an impact on this and it causes for the variation of R groups. It allows for um, hydrophilic areas of the protein, which means that which means like areas that interact with water to be on the outside, while hydrophobic areas, which do not react with water, are in the inside of the protein. So as you can see, each protein is a combination of beta sheets and alpha helices. And this is a quaternary structure of a protein, and this is basically when four different tertiary, and when multiple um, tertiary structure, so multiple of these, they form together into one, um, unit, one protein unit. So as you can see, this is four different tertiary structure units. So basically quaternary structure is this one, they all come together to form one protein unit. Okay, these are the properties of carbohydrates and they're basically just connected by covalent bonds and they can have different shapes. For example, they can be straight or they can be branched. Okay, next we're gonna be talking about nucleic acids, the difference between DNA and RNA. So they hold multiple differences as well as multiple similarities. For one, DNA has deoxyribose sugar as its five carbon sugar, while RNA has ribose sugar as its five carbon sugar. And another difference is that thymine is exclusive to DNA, while uracil is exclusive to RNA. 
meaning that you won't find your cell in DNA, but you won't find thymine in RNA. And another difference is that DNA is double-stranded, while RNA is only one strand. And both RNA and DNA have the same three components, as I explained earlier. They both have a sugar group, they both have a phosphate group, and they both have a nitrogenous base. And um, they are both connected through covalent bonds, so each monomer is connected by covalent bonds that run from 5 prime to 3 prime ends. And they they both contain the same nitrogenous bases, which are adenine, guanine, and cytosine. Okay, and if that's that's it for this unit. Please let us know anything you want to improve on, anything you want us to improve on, anything you want us to explain. Maybe I'm talking too boring, who knows? Maybe you want to see more visual diagrams. Please let us know in the comments. We really appreciate all the support. We really appreciate all the constructive criticism. And thank you guys. And